Hi and welcome to Themic. In this video, we will talk about how to find out the number of degrees of freedom of complex multibody systems. Let's go back to our basic principle, the total possible number of degrees of freedom that a body can have, and first refresh our memory. When we talk about degrees of freedom, we simply talk about the possibility of movements, and when we talk about constraints, we refer to any device or artifact used to cancel any of these degrees of freedom. This implies that a multiple degree of freedom system is a system that can move in more than one way. For example, a block of mass floating in space could translate in three directions and it could also rotate about the three Cartesian axis. So the block has six degrees of freedom, three translations and three rotations. Or if you want to come back to Earth and look at simple two-dimensional examples, you'll remember the example of a pendulum attached to the ground using a hinge meaning a revolute joint. Yes, you remembered it correctly. It can only rotate about an axis that is coincident with the axis of the hinge or the revolute joint. This means that it has one degree of freedom, which is a rotation. And do you remember what happens when we attach another rod block to this pendulum using another revolute joint? You're right. The double pendulum has two degrees of freedom, which are two rotations. Now we will explore the mathematical formulation of all this explanation which will lead to correct results every time, even when things get more complicated. And guess what? It's really simple to apply. You only need to know three things. Number one, if it's a 2D or 3D representation. Number two, number of bodies of the system, which we will call N. Number three, number and type of constraints used. Well. There are really four things you need to know. For a two-dimensional representation, we will multiply the number of bodies times three, which are the maximum possible number of degrees of freedom on planar movement. Mathematically, this is represented as three times n. This represents the maximum combined number of degrees of freedom of the system, all bodies included. Now, as you remember from the pendulum example, we need to account for the constraints used and the number of restrictions imposed by these constraints. In a two-dimensional movement, the constraints used can restrict one, two, and even three types of movements. This means that we need to understand how many restrictions are imposed by each type of constraint. If we say that the constraints that impose one restriction are called J1, those that impose two are called J2, and, well, you got it those that impose 3 are J3. Then the final number of degrees of freedom of a system is written as 3 times n minus J1 plus 2 times J2 plus 3 times J3. For the spatial case, it is pretty similar to this, but with more terms, and instead of a 3 multiplying the number of bodies, it would be a 6, because that's the maximum number of degrees of freedom a single body might have in space. The extra terms are those constraints that can restrict 4, 5, or 6 movements. With the respective names J4, J5, and J6, mathematically, it is represented as 6 times n minus J1 plus 2 times J2 plus 3 times J3 plus 4 times J4 plus 5 times J5 plus 6 times J6. Let's test our mathematical formulation to calculate the resultant number of degrees of freedom of the previous example where we used common sense to determine this number. It is clear that we have four bodies and two revolute joints, or J2. Now something we didn't mention was that each block was rigidly connected to its corresponding rod. This adds two rigid connections of fixed joints, or J3. These fixed joints, as the name states, restrict any possible movement between the two bodies being joined. Now writing everything in our planar equation, 3 times 4 minus 2 times 2 plus 2 times 3 equals 12 minus 10 equals 2 degrees of freedom. This is exactly what we got before, and we didn't need to think about how bodies actually move, but how they are related to each other and ground via constraints. Hopefully you got the idea of how to calculate the number of degrees of freedom on a multiple degree of freedom system. I told you that it would be really simple, and it absolutely was, wasn't it? Thanks for watching and stay tuned for our next video.